as a kid, you know, our family was, for the lack of a better word, uh, poor. I mean, it's not something you really realize as a kid. It's something that usually gets pointed out to you as an insult from another kid. Uh, usually those other kids, I don't know, they, they do it to make themselves feel better, maybe feel rich, or show off something they have that you don't, but <clears throat> it was it was something you wouldn't find other poor kids using as like a, as a wedge, as, as a hack. It, we called it hacking on each other. Um, poor kid to poor kid hacks, they had to be way more witty than that. But anyway, yeah, we grew up poor, and... I guess how the classic novel goes, you know, there's all these hidden luxuries uh, growing up poor. And, you know, reflecting back on it, I would agree. In hindsight, as memories, um, they were awesome. And one of them would be the fact that you would, you'd have to live out in the country. Because the, the further away from, like, stoplights and grocery stores, all those conveniences that make a town a town... Uh, makes people pay for them so the further away from them you get the harder it is to live and the cheaper the cheaper it is to live so we uh we lived out in the boonies man like way out in the boonies it was a luxury of being poor out there you'd be uh you get two tv channels you know uh pbs and nbc I think, it was, yeah, NBC. On a clear day, you, you'd get, I think Fox would come in so we could watch The Simpsons and stuff. But, I mean, who who wants to be inside on a clear day, man? But, <clears throat> so, we lived in, like, the, uh, the rolling foothills on the west side of the, the Appalachians. And them deep valleys that, that the creeks and rivers that feed the Mississippi come out of. We lived up in there. Uh, it was kind of untouched by modern intrusions and industries. It'd take us like 40, I don't know, 35, 45 minutes to get to town, driving through them hilly, twisty, turny uh, roads. We'd go to town, I know we'd go to town once or twice a month just for groceries. Uh, we had two grocery stores in town. <laughs> uh, for the longest time it was just the one and that was that was pay less and then we got more for less and we wound up going there a lot because as mom said we got more for less you know uh, but uh, yeah we lived pretty far from town and I remember I took it upon myself to start walking it we had this fellow around there this dude, he he had his own urban legend associated with him. That's another story to itself. But he would be on one end, one end of the county in the morning and the other end of the county that evening, dude. That dude walked everywhere in that county. He's a skinny old guy. So I figured if, if this guy can do it, I can do it. So maybe 14-ish, 15-ish was the first time I had walked from where we lived way out in the boonies all the way into the big town all 1700 people man uh, it'd take 12 maybe 16 hours uh, and after I did it so many times I'd found some shortcuts it would also depend on the weather day or night you know we lived out there I mean, I say we lived out there. We were we were either the first kids on the school bus or the last kids off the school bus as kids. And, I mean, the school bus ride was anywhere from, you know, an hour when we were in that grade school to an hour and a half almost um, when we had to go to the county high school. Uh, but... Yeah, we lived out there, man. Now, as a teenager, I'd often go hiking. You know, I'd take the dogs. I'd go saying hunting when it was saying season. I'd go shroom hunting when the when morales were in. Uh, if there wasn't any anything for hunting, I'd go out there just to find some of the rare 
orchids and stuff that lived in that area uh, that my mom liked you know yellow or uh, pink lady slippers they were super rare but awesome to find trilliums I found uh, this uh, orchid called a dragon's tongue one time it was insane but it was just something else I'd do when I was walking around looking around the woods man I remember one time I was out mushroom hunting and I found what what I called ancient morels because they were totally out of place um, the normal morel in Kentucky man you're talking maybe the size of your thumb maybe three four inches tall and that's a big morel uh, and they were you know usually like this ash gray they were dark but these were huge and they were like this yellow gold um, and they were like <laughs> I don't know 8 to 16 maybe 18 inches tall they were huge dude uh, I found I don't know a half dozen to a dozen of them when I went walking I always carried two things guaranteed and that was a, a butter knife in a, a Walmart bag uh, that way if I found anything I could dig it up and bring it home all excited like you know well this day I found those those mushrooms and you know I said I found I don't know six to twelve well however many it was it filled that Walmart bag that's how big they were and I got him back to the house I was all excited uh, we were hesitant to eat them we weren't even sure if they were morels they were so big uh, mom you know she, hollow stemmed she said certain things and she went ahead and cooked one and the smell of it said they were good and then we ate one and we waited like a day you know and uh, everything was good so we wound up eating all of them and I don't know I wish we had taken pictures of them or measured them or anything I bet they were state records but they were ancient looking it's the one thing I remember the most so as country as country kids uh, we grew up you know playing stuff I guess you'd only do if you if you grew out in the country like uh, we had this game we played barn tag where uh, the tobacco barns during the off season when they weren't uh, dry and tobacco there would be these big barns that were completely empty and we'd go into them and we'd climb up into them poles and we'd chase each other around and and knock each other off and laugh and I mean it was crazy uh, the one time our, our friend fell down he broke his wrist and stood up his bone was sticking out of his skin and we're all just laughing he was too and we got to our parents they were not laughing <laughs> but I mean we would play uh, we would throw corn cobs at each other you know after the farmer had plowed the field uh, we'd go out there and there'd be the dried ones left over this would usually be like a fall type thing and uh, you'd go out there and you'd pick them up and you'd break them the reason you break them is so the where you broke them those kernels kind of flared out so when you threw it and it hit uh, those flared out kernels would just explode and go in all directions it, it wasn't the same if you didn't break them but yeah good times uh, I say all this because well we grew up tough as nails dude just crazy to look back on it some of y'all may have heard that song Old Town Road well we live down a real Old Town Road uh, where um, this event in particular occurred was a uh, it was like it was this old log cabin that was on this ridge line plateau I say that because it was downhill in all directions and out on this plateau I don't know it was maybe 10 acres and the road ran north to south and on that 10 acres was our old cabin that we lived in had been you know modernized with like vinyl siding and a tin roof um, but down the road a little bit on that same plateau um, 
where our mailbox was it was like the old schoolhouse it was like an old one room schoolhouse uh, leftover remnants from this town man um, this town had slowly been abandoned like over a hundred year course it was um, unincorporated I don't think they ever had like an official town center but it was a town and if I'm going off the dates on the graveyard it's a really really old town some of them uh, headstones in particular there's a corner of the graveyard that has its own kind of foundation bricks um, that that block it off from the rest of the graveyard and in that kind of squared off area those headstones have like an additional hundred years on them um, from like the I guess the French or whoever else could have colonized that area before Europeans showed up and then like the rest of the graveyard is the European thing like there was an old conflict that took place at that town probably ain't ever been recorded you know so one one more story about the uh, the graveyard was um, as kids we used to uh, take this back road it, it's not on any map it's not even the one we would use to uh, get to and from town and the school would run this one's different this is like an old road that uh, has trees growing out of it but you could tell you know it was a road at one point in the past and it would run down uh, the valley around uh, basically between the the old school and that graveyard and, and down that old road how we also knew it was an old road is um, the the ridge it ran on the back side of the graveyard there was this old like 19 teens maybe 1920s uh, pickup truck that had run into a tree and it had sat there ever since it hit that tree you know what I mean I mean it was just rusting away and dying at the at the tree it hit um, uh, but we would take that road at night between our house to the graveyard um, and you know during Halloween other kids would come over and hang out with us because uh, our mom was really really cool and I I guess that made us the cool kids you know but everybody would come over and and we would take that that old road over to the uh, old graveyard and we'd spook each other out and stuff we'd always play tag and run around there um, even lay down on the graves you know we never we never gave it two thoughts as kids it was just fun to do but that was that was an old graveyard like the uh, that that old school um, we used to walk around in there too and I say used to on that because it wound up burning down one night. Um, they used to store uh, hay pretty much in this huge triangular section around the school. And from what we were told that some bales were put up wet and that's what started the fire. And I remember the fire started way back up in the corner of the hay. You know, and we, we were trying to, we knew it was coming. We done called uh, the fire department, but we lived so far out, it took them almost two hours just to get to us. And by that time, that hay, the wind, the hay, and there, it engulfed that schoolhouse. And it, it was honestly quite scary because um, of its location to our house. But before it b burned down, we, we used to walk around in there you know and uh, only thing in it really was on the back wall you could tell the chalkboard hung there because there was like an outline and I guess from age it just got whatever was holding it up didn't hold it up any longer and it fell down and it was broken right there at the bottom uh, laying in front of that wall 
but aside from that it was just it was a really old building and it it smelled really old you know it was all black too the whole building was solid black the roof the walls inside and out solid black but that that graveyard is is very reflective as to the age uh, of the town and how long people been in these valleys um, it's not even the first old town we lived in before we moved to uh, to this house um, the other house we lived in um, you know that that town was in a different direction where the post offices and everything was one of our friends his mom worked at a post office there and let's just say that was off to the east and us as kids would run around with our, our friends and they would take us to the old town version of the town uh, they told us like the town used to be down here and they, they moved it out like 70 or 100 years prior or 150 years prior or something when they, uh, they moved the post office but the old town was still down there and we used to go around there as kids and play but there are several old towns in that area so that's where we lived in the pretty much the uh, the cheapest house money could afford you down an old town road and a really old log cabin uh, now this particular event that I'm going to tell you tell you about is uh, it happened um, the fall before my oldest brother was going off to boot camp and a little backstory is well, as kids we always would like go cold weather camping it was like a, a little custom we did kinda in the uh, first or second week of January you know in the heart of winter us three boys would go out and, and test ourselves against mother nature over the weekend or you know sometimes we would be off due to snow and we would take advantage of that and make it during that time but we would go cold weather camping and that that uh, that custom kind of fell out with uh, the oldest brother graduating and some of his friends going off to college and military and like my brother oldest brother went to college and now he was going to go to the military and the next in line oldest brother he was in college so so me and him we were going to go one last time you know what i mean and this time this time we were going to go farther uh we were really going to push ourselves we were going to go farther than we ever had before and make it harder we, than we ever had before with less supplies you know uh, he was going off to boot camp so we were going to test ourselves you know <laughs> and no uh, no flashlights was another rule which I mean that turned out being regrettable but um yeah so an old timer uh, from down the dirt road we used to live on told us with all seriousness on his face years prior he he came on by when we first moved there as a family because um, we were introduced into the neighborhood uh, pretty good the way we came in um, I'm not going into details because and I don't want to give away who who I am and where we were you know what I mean so but this old man come by he was kind of like the the unelected official in the area he was always running up and down them back roads in his uh beat up I don't know how the hell it ran Ford pickup he come by you know it had like 500,000 miles on it he always bragged about it having 500,000 miles and all this stuff but this old man would always be running up and down them roads he would trade with anyone anywhere for anything at any time for I mean just anything um, but 
he came by when we first moved in and he gave us the old uh, people around here conversation you know and one of the things he said is if you wander off any beaten path if you go too deep into any woods if you go out in the night you should always have some sort of a glow you should always carry a light <clears throat> you don't go out at night without a light it was just kind of like the rules in them valleys you know uh, anywhere in the anywhere in them woods in those counties uh, and people that's lived there for I don't know 100 200 years 300 years uh, th those are the people that have those rules if you ain't lived there long enough or you don't know the right people then you don't know that rule so but uh, that being said when when we decided to go without flashlights that was one of the incentives was we were gonna test this this unspoken rule and see what would become of it you know and um, yeah Although it'd be fair to say uh, we didn't find out why he didn't go out at night without a light until years later. And uh, I'm not going to go into much detail about the event, but uh, I'm going to mention it because I want to say the other thing, which is, you know, we had another fear of what was out there. It wasn't just that we wasn't going without a light. I mean, yeah, we lived on a, a cattle farm with like 3,800 head of cattle. So cattle alone at night without a light, they can be a little spooky. They'll they'll bluff you. They'll, they'll charge at you uh, if, if they don't know what you are, you know. But um, the other reason it was scary to go out at night without a light was um, a couple years prior to, to us going out, it was maybe not even two years, maybe a year, year and a half. Um, we were coming home one night, and uh, it was my dad, my oldest brother, um, my sister, uh, and two family friends. Both of uh, both of them friends of ours that were coming coming over to hang out for the night. It was like a Saturday night, you know. It was like. Uh, well, if I was, I, I'd say it was like midnight, 1230. <clears throat> and, uh, we all saw what we saw with 100% confidence. And, uh, why is it called the big black hairy thing? Well, when we were sitting there, just come to a full stop in the middle of the road slapping shoulders can't say anything like uh, 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 that's what came out those were like the first words were big black hairy thing you know <laughs> and it was that was a you know a pretty good description of what we all just saw with like 100 percent certainty and uh so and that's another story but um so we knew the big black hairy thing was also out there too um it was another high intensity like we're doing this man you know we're gonna test everything when we go on this trip um but <clears throat> another little detail is our dog abel um he was a doverman dalmatian family dog we'd had him uh I think five or six years at at this by this particular event um, and I mean years prior he uh, we put a backpack on him one of our smaller backpacks and he carried you know a couple towels or something and it, he had developed to where when he saw that backpack coming out he knew he was going on an adventure you know he got all excited he had a stump tail but you could see that little thing just wobbling back and forth so I mean we were taking Abel and Abel was gonna hold the, uh, the two-man emergency tent you know it was lightweight no biggie and maybe a little little thing of water too that's what he would normally carry uh, when I'd go saying hunting and stuff 
would be some water but so Abel was coming also and uh, <clears throat> he's a good dog I mean good dog like he was a good dog one whistle that dog would do I'd say a 50 60 foot sweep all around make sure the snakes everything you're good to walk you know what I mean uh, you'd say you know Abel and he'd come right back you know you'd whistle twice he'd come right back you would do a long one whistle and that dog would go out about a eighth of a mile maybe quarter mile and he would run the whole valley he'd make sure there wasn't nothing in that whole valley and if there was he'd start he'd do a location bark you know it just bow, bow, bow. he'd just start a, going at it um, but he was a good dog really handy in the woods it eliminated when I would go walking he eliminated the, the necessity to have that ground pound stick uh, to keep the snakes away because he, he made a pretty good amount of noise but so the the setup is uh it was you know late September I'd say it was just after the equinox or right around the equinox it was late September um, a storm had just rolled through which the storm was so intense that it it had us thinking we ain't even going tonight you know we're gonna have to put this off <clears throat> But then we were like, you know what? No, we're going. It's going to add to the intensity of the, the night. You know, everything's about how hardcore we're doing it. So why are we going to back down over a little uh, thunderstorm, you know? Um, so, and, and the thunderstorm actually cleared up uh, just before sunset, uh, which is when we set out. You know, we had about 10, maybe 15 minutes of that sun tip light just before it it fell behind the horizon and I mean it it lit up the whole sky uh, where we lived in Kentucky during hurricane season as they call it um, the skies would be this burning orange or red or even like intense pinks from whatever kind of clouds from wherever the dust you know uh, it would make the sunsets like really intense and this just happened to be one of those and <clears throat> the uh it was also fall so we had all the golden and reds and and yellow uh leaves from the the, the oaks and the, the poplar and the, you know and there was even some sort of a, a purple type color uh tree leaf that was going on so the valleys they were still like super filled the storm had blown off the ridge top leaves <clears throat> so the horizon looked like a skeleton of trees already but the valley still had the uh, the leaves on them and in that like uh, last 10 15 minutes of light when we sat out you know it, it made it real magical it was a, a perfect start uh, it was it was awesome the sky was lit up uh, the valleys were glowing those leaves had fallen down on on the on the forest floor to make like this golden carpet uh, reflecting like whatever light was available to the dying twilight um, giving it even more of an enchanted awesomeness man and that's what we set out into uh, that was the setting um, for for the beginning of the night I mean, in the years prior, when we would go, we'd go maybe a valley or two in. Uh, we wouldn't go that deep. So, if anything came up, even if we just got hungry and wanted to run home and get something to drink or eat, we could do that and get back to camp in like 20, 30 minutes. Uh, we had done it so many times, we could do it blindfolded, you know. But but this time, we were going miles away. Uh, I had found this. Uh, neat little pond uh, probably that same week if I'm remembering it correctly it was that exact same week and by that weekend like I was so hyped up about this 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 pond 
that it sparked this whole idea and that's why we were going so uh, this pond was miles away from the house man and what was cool about it I, I stumbled upon it it was this like this little uh, crystal clear blue pond that just faded off in the darkness but the darkness was like a silver reflection uh, in the center it was like maybe a hundred feet in diameter uh, like the water was clear as air but it had this turquoise blue in its in its thickness uh, you could go out like a fishing poles length into the water and it'd just be enough to soak your socks in your shoes but uh, if you walked any more than that it really had a pretty steep slope to it uh, so I was actually looking forward to casting the line down there and seeing how deep it really was I figured it was at least 50 feet deep uh, but I mean this thing was hidden in this grove of these ancient looking cedars and I mean ancient looking they were twisted and gnarled and uh, in, in the mix of them was like these ancient dead uh, uh, chestnut trees that had long si since died and I mean they were still standing though you know standing skeletons all hollowed out and twisted and gnarled but you could tell they were old uh, this one in particular on the on the north side of that pond was it was one of the ones that would have took all three of us brothers and dad holding hands to get around it was a big one we'd, we'd seen big trees like that before but if uh, an American chestnut that big dude that was a rare find but um the plan was to go go to that pond uh, which was hidden in them trees too uh, I've walked that ridge at least a hundred maybe 500 times years prior I had never found that pond I stumbled upon it and that's <clears throat> that's why I was so excited you know it was a real find and I wanted to share it because it, it had a magical quality to it uh, and uh, but the plan was to hike there no flashlights, just, you know, a sparker, um, a hatchet, a uh, machete, some, some line, some hooks, some, uh, some bread for bait, some sinkers, you know, not even a pole. We were going to hand fish it, uh, you know, bare minimum, um, an emergency, we were going <clears> to, <throat> okay, so we were bringing an emergency uh, tent. But the plan was to go there, set up bushcraft tent, you know, bushcraft uh, uh, hut for sleeping, catch dinner, you know, eat, sleep, wake up, get home, you know, just just make it through the night out there in this distant area. Uh, and well, things didn't quite go as planned. So, reaching back into almost a 30-year memory, my brother was involved. I figured, you know, I'd ask him what he remembers. Real vague, like, you know, what do you remember about that last hardcore camping trip after the thunderstorm that we, uh, we went and did to that pond before you went off to boot camp? And uh, he replied back, uh, not much, vaguely. And I was like, well, what do you mean by vaguely? And he goes, I know we were stupid and didn't use a flashlight. And, and the night was really scary. Um, but he, he admitted that... <clears throat> and this isn't TMI, because I'm not saying who I am, and I'm not revealing who he is. But he, through the his 20 years plus of, of military service, um, he... He can't remember much prior to the military, and he's actually in therapy for it. It's like the fog of war, man. Um, it wiped out a lot of what he what he knew before the military. It's like all he knows is a little bit here and there, 
and then everything else is just military on so and so that kind of added to the urgency of really why I wanted to do it uh, I mean there's there's a lot of tales that we used to tell when we lived it and were in it and we noticed you know once we left that that state it wasn't the same when we told them like I mean city folk and, and suburban folk they just don't understand what what us country folk know and when you sit there and you try and explain that to them uh, well so only only so many times you could tell a story and be looked at like it's not believable before it becomes embarrassing and you wind up not telling it and, and you'll actually change how you tell it you know so and then you find out you know that's not even why am I even telling it you know so then you just you stop telling it because you got to be around the right people to tell tell them stories and we just weren't around those type people anymore you know it, when we were in those sticks dude everybody knew what the hell we were talking about I mean it, it was different so but that's kind of why I wanted to, to document it was so it wasn't forgotten to the fog of time so so off we went you know hoorah off into the night young dumb you know the rest of that saying and uh, I mean there was a reason for us to be honorary uh, quite versed in everything in the woods spent a lot of time in them woods man I could run barefoot through them woods for miles I didn't even need shoes you know but you know so off we go uh, the sun it went down we had at that time of the year maybe you know 15 20 minutes of that dying twilight where it just slowly got darker and darker and darker and depending on the canopy of woods uh, it got real dark real quick um, so to get there we had to we had to go a pretty specific route and I mean we hadn't gotten but maybe 20 30 minutes past the graveyard and we were coming across across in this uh, creek where we had to run this long linear field and this creek was like that valley was already prehistoric to itself um, uh, it had I mean the Appalachian Mountains are old as hell man but uh, we were coming up on this creek anyway um, and Abel just took off I didn't tell him to take off nobody took him to take off he wasn't barking he just straight west dude that dog booked it booked it and I figured maybe he he smelled something or he saw something I don't know if he saw something once he uh, verified he was seeing something he'd let us know he'd bark you know but he was gone um, and we kept going didn't think nothing of it well after about you know 30 minutes I called you know whistled called we both did he did not reply whistled called that dog did not reply I was like you know he's kind of done that before I ain't gonna think nothing of it I'll just keep going but we started getting this like eerie feeling dude here we are it it's it's dark um, and right now we're using what what starlight's available we're getting through the woods um, the woods are, are dark but our eyes had adjusted pretty good and we were able to you know move around and mitigate through the forest using the the, uh, the freshly laid golden carpet um, as a guide until we would get out into the next field and you know kind of get our bearings and line up with the stars and try and call Abel a couple more times but we eventually stopped trying to call Abel because uh, it was getting rather creepy and I mean we would there was times we would pause and it was like neither one of us would breathe we would just look at each other 
listen. And then normally that time of the year, you'd be hearing crickets. They'd be slow, but they'd be there. You'd hear some Katie Dids, uh, the Whippoorwills, and they sound just like their name says. They Whippoorwill, man. Um, you'd hear like some some owls doing that humming they do, like a I can't even do it, but they, they do like this hum and out in the distance past that you should be hearing like some some hoot owls or something, man. And th this forest, these woods, this night was strangely a uh, little more quiet than usual, especially if you consider we, we had no light source. So uh, it it should be even louder than normal and with the woods all wet like they were we were moving through them pretty pretty quiet even through the fields um but so it was kind of creepy ain't gonna lie and then i'd say we were an hour and a half maybe two hours in um and there was a couple times we felt lost but and right around that two hour mark you, you started hearing we started hearing off in the distance Abel doing his his location bark he almost sounded like a bloodhound um, he just he just started boom 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 but he sounded like he was a good three four valleys over he did not sound like he was close at all, but you could tell that was Abel. And, you know, so we started whistling and calling and whistling and calling. It kind of broke the moment of intensity. Um, and whistling and calling. We had these little indigo wristwatches. That was like a thing back then, man. Uh, but we that was our only light source uh, was those. We would use those. And, for some reason those little faint glows when we pushed them it gave this slight comfort i suppose and here we are we're calling to our dog with our wrist watches you know and like he, he just stopped barking and so we waited 10 20 minutes and then we we moved on you know uh, got our bearings went through the next little patch of woods there were several times we went through and when you go through these patches what you're looking for is a bright spot on the back side because that's the next field and um sometimes you can see them and other times you got to kind of you got to guesstimate especially at night time uh, and since the the woods had that carpet instead of being able to identify the golden field light capturing the starlight in the distance through the woods you had all this golden additional hue kind of messing with you to identify that distant patch you were looking for yeah, I don't know if that makes any sense but we we missed and we uh we missed a couple of what we thought was going to be the stretch and after walking so far in we were like dude this is way too far you know, if what we saw is what we saw, then we should have done been there. Because we're almost losing sight of where we left. So we would go back to where we left, you know, and get our bearings and go further up and down the, the field we're in, trying to find the entrance through this next patch of woods. And we got twisted around a lot. And it was like in between about every two or three little twist arounds we would hear Abel there he was location bark going to town way off in the distance but it was Abel we knew it and we called and once again he would break the insanity of that trip he would like bring it back to reality that hey man that's our dog why ain't he with us you know and, and we would call with no fear no remorse and he just he wouldn't he wasn't finding us so and we just kept going forward it just you know it was intense so anything that we encountered that we said man this is messed up this is intense it would wind up being a conversation of this is why we're here you know so we just kept going <clears throat> and it took uh, probably five hours to get to this pond and I, I didn't think I'd ever I was ever gonna find it and then 
there it was, you know. Finally. Um, so, we get there. Uh, it's like, yeah. And I'm showing him, I'm like, check this out, check that out. And he's like, yeah, it's pretty cool. One of the coolest things was, okay, the, underneath this, um, the old chestnut on the north side I was telling you about. <clears throat> the ground was so spongy soft, it felt like a mattress. Like a, like a foam mattress you'd get nowadays. <clears throat> and we figured it was because this big ancient tree canopy just fell down. And it's like in the process, he's uh, uh, breaking down, and it, it felt like a cork. It was softer than cork, but we figured it to be cork. So um, that's where we wanted to set up camp. So we had to go around and, and you know, gather a, enough rocks to make like a trash can sized lid area. But we couldn't just throw the fire on it, because uh, that wasn't ground, that was like cork you know so <clears throat> we had to go get some dirt and now this is crazy because I went to go dig for dirt and so the you got like normally in the woods you'd have I don't know maybe a half inch to an inch you know two or three inches if it was fluffed up <clears throat> of like uh, the last ten years or so of debris that it build up and you'd have to move that aside to get to the actual dirt if you if you follow me well, that layer in these woods was, I'd say, 12 to, I don't know, 15 inches. It was insane. At first, I didn't think I was going to find dirt. I didn't know what was going on. Dude, by the time I found dirt, you, you could put a jar of pickles down in there and cover it without ever hitting dirt. And that pickle jar would be gone. It was like I was digging through 500 to 1,000 years of uh, almost undeteriorated uh, foliage to get down to the dirt level. It, it's just, I didn't think nothing of it at the time, but I, I found it odd. But I, there was such an urgency to establish a fire, I didn't give it two thoughts. I was just like, where in the hell is the dirt? you know and when I found it I was like hell yeah and uh, you know the first I, I dug the first spot I didn't find no dirt so I moved to another spot and I didn't find no dirt I'm like maybe it's just the tree top so I moved you know out towards the edge of the uh, cedar circle but I was still in the circle and you know I'm digging down and at that point I done given up it ain't nothing that fell down I just gotta find this dirt and I got that dirt and I hauled it back and I filled the center of the uh of the rock circle with the dirt so we could put fire on top of it without it burning the ground you know so then we got a we got a spark we got a flame we built our fire and something strange about them them cedar trees is the, the old fallen ones and even the ones you'd break off the heartwood of them cedars lit up like it had an oil source so the, it was real easy to start a fire there 100% um, we, we had a fire going it was nice and bright you know we were kicking back we had baited up we had caught a couple bluegill with the bread and uh, or whatever they were pumpkin seed I'm pretty sure they were baby baby bluegill and uh, so we had up, upped our hooks and dropped a drop the bluegill in there a piece you know because we wanted a real dinner because these were only maybe one or two inches and uh so we were kicking kicking back and we started hearing abel again you know except he was once again he's way off in the distance so still doing the same uh location bark we whistle we hoot we holler we had no fear we had our our fire going you know we done calm down all the all the danger and fear endorsed adrenaline pumping transversal part was over and we were going to catch our dinner and stuff we needed our dog you know he was part of this adventure and well that's when we heard a series of uh pretty messed up things 
Now the first one wasn't too messed up, you know. It was odd, but it wasn't too messed up. It was you heard some chirping, some coyotes chirping, and a couple, a couple little barks, but they were doing their chirps, you know. They weren't really, they weren't calling. They were chirping, uh, and they definitely were way closer than than Abel. And I say it's odd because it was the dark of the moon and normally the dark of the moon you wouldn't hear any coyote activity um, you're more likely to see a coyote during the daytime than during the dark of the moon but <clears throat> in the years prior I'd, I'd say it started uh, early 90s um, we noticed the coyotes uh, instead of being that like a white and a gold they were like a, a gold to a tan and some of them even had like this mahogany look to them like a deep dark color um, and there was less white and less gold so these were kind of like uh, they weren't really bigger but they didn't look as scraggly you know so anyway um, so we heard them we heard them chirping you know, I pointed it out. I said it out loud. I said, that's odd. It's the dark of the moon. You know? And it was just about that time. We heard... We heard what I often describe as a metallic dog bark. And I say that because it sounds like... See, I, I've been around construction. So the back of a dump truck, when it slams that door after it's dumps, it dumped its load, you know, that wham it makes. Um, it was that loud. And that can be really loud if you know what I'm talking about. And it wasn't just that. It had this super huge breed, like Great Dane type um, guttural roll, like guttural growl, guttural bark right as the the door slam hits and uh what feet what leads up to it is kind of like i have described it as if you drag uh, a cinder block on some on some concrete like not concrete with stuff all over it just nice open flat poured fresh concrete that's dried and it's cured and you got a cinder block and you drag it across it that hollow concrete sound, that's what would lead into the guttural bark slam. And it, it hit like a crescendo. This one, this one was the loudest we ever heard. And I say loudest because we've heard that before, uh, years before. Um, we done figured it's about every three years we'd hear that around there. and. My dad called it the alpha dog, and it's not like it was that common here at all. That particular sound I'm describing, I'd only heard a handful of times, and if you heard it, it was way off in the distance. But if you heard it, everything between it and you stopped making a sound. Just like that. And when you hear that sound out in the middle of the night, uh, even if you're standing on your porch in the comfort right outside of your house, that that'll scare the that'll scare the Jesus out of you. You you'll feel you'll feel like there's evil present. That ain't no doubt. And that night we heard it. It sounded like it was right outside. Them cedar trees. <laughs> 